Oh boy. In this section, I will teach you the names of things, which is honestly not the most exciting part of chemistry because it has very little to do with chemistry and more to do with human communication, like a foreign language. Still, you and I are humans, and it's important that the words exiting my human mouth and entering your human ears make you think of the same things that my human brain does. So buckle up or buckle down and commit yourself to learning the names of things, all conveniently packaged in one lesson. This section is divided into ionic and covalent compounds, which have different naming rules. We'll also cover how to name acids, which are different than either ionic or covalent compounds, even though acids have properties of both ionic and covalent compounds. We'll start with ionic compounds, which form patterns of repeating ions, which extend for billions of atoms in all directions. Salts are formed from a cation and an anion. And generally, a salt's name will be two words, the cation, then the anion, ending in ide. There are three broad categories of ions with slightly different nomenclatures, and we'll go through them one at a time. Main group names are different for cations and anions. Cations have the same name as the element. Anions have the same name of the element except with the suffix Ide. So the ionic compound formed between sodium and nitrogen is sodium nitride. The compound formed from aluminum and oxygen is aluminum oxide. I warned you earlier that transition metals and metalloids are not as predictable as the main group elements. They can form ions of different charges. So to make things easier, chemists write the charge in the name using Roman numerals. For example, iron forms two ions. Iron two plus is called iron two, and iron three plus is named iron three. Similarly, tin two plus is named tin two, and tin four plus is named tin four. As always, there are exceptions. Silver only forms a one plus ion and zinc only forms a two plus ion. The charge of these is not written in the name so you will need to know it. With stupid exceptions come stupid mnemonics. Silver is expensive so I can only afford one. The Z in zinc looks like the number two. You will need to know the name and the charge of these monatomic ions on exams. You should use the periodic table for help. You will also need to know the name and the charge for these ions, but it's significantly easier since the charge is written in the name. Lastly, some ions are composed of multiple atoms held together by covalent bonds. These ions are called polyatomic ions. In most reactions, the polyatomic ion will stay together as one unit. This is the worst part of today's lesson. You will need to memorize these polyatomic ions. It's actually extremely important since the polyatomic ions are common in chemical compounds and reactions in this course. I highly recommend you make flashcards for everything on this slide along with the things on the previous slide. Some sets of polyatomic ions follow a pattern where the nonmetal atom and the charge are the same, but they have different numbers of oxygen atoms. Let's explore that. One example is the chlorate series. Notice that all of these entries have a chlorine in them. All of them have a minus one charge, yet they have different numbers of oxygen. Same with the sulfate series. The most common ion of the series is usually named eight. I recommend memorizing the four eights that are shown here, and then remembering this table, which can convert the eights into the different entries, depending on how many oxygens have been added or removed. Remember, within a series, the charge on the ion is the same. So just memorize the eights, 
and memorize the naming rules in the upper right table. And you can use both to get all the ites and the per eights and the hypo ites. That's how we name ionic compounds. In general, we'll name cation first and then anion, and they mostly end in ide unless it includes a polyatomic anion. Importantly, salts, as they are written, must have a neutral charge. In this case, for these examples, we need to increase the number of nitrates in the formula as the charge on the cation increases. Use parentheses and subscripts to indicate how much of each ion is needed for the plus and minus charges to balance. All right, here you go, your first practice problem. Pause the video and write the name and formula for the ionic compounds formed from these elements. The solutions are written here on the page. Remember that in order to know the formula, you need to know the charge on each ion so that the charges can balance correctly. Moving on to covalent compounds. Covalent compounds are completely different than ionic compounds. Covalent compounds form discrete molecules such as glucose. If you cut a molecule in half, you turn it into a different substance. This is different than salts, which are repeating patterns of ions. If you cut a salt crystal in half, you get two salt crystals of the same substance. For many covalent compounds, we use the common name. Two examples of commonly named covalent compounds are water, H2O, and ammonia, NH3. When not using the common name, you will name the elements from left to right on the periodic table. Use the prefixes in the table to the right to indicate how many atoms of that element are in the molecule. The last element in the name will end in ide. Notice in the four examples below that we don't use the prefix mono on the first element. Lastly, acids. Acids are a special compound that you'll be getting familiar with later. Acids are special because they have a very reactive hydrogen ion. Even though acids are made of molecules, they often behave like an ion pair. The spicy hydrogen atom is always the cation of the acid, and the acid gets its name from the anion. Therefore, in order to name acids, you need to know the names of common anions, especially the polyatomic ions. The acid's name depends on the suffix of the anion which could be ide, ate, or ite. If the anion ends in ide, then the acid is named hydro blank ic acid. If the anion ends in ate, then the acid is named blank ic acid. If the anion ends in ite, then the acid is a blank us acid. Here's an example with some chlorine acid. Chloride, becomes hydrochloric acid, chlorate becomes chloric acid, and chlorite becomes chlorous acid. As always, I have two stupid mnemonics to help you remember the eights and the ites. First, say, I ate acid, ick. Or imagine someone asks you, hey, how y'all doing? And you say, oh, us, we're ite. And there you go, all the naming rules of chemistry packed into one convenient lesson. Pause the video here and try your hand at these practice problems. All right, here are the solutions. Dicarbon tetroxide is named as a covalent compound, so it is a molecule. Use the prefixes to know how much of each atom there are. Phosphoric acid, well, Ick comes from eight. Phosphate has a three minus charge. Therefore, phosphoric acid must have three hydrogen atoms. Calcium and sulfate both have a two charge, so no further subscripts are needed. And the formula for calcium sulfate is CaSO4.
the first compound is an ion, is a, an ionic compound of potassium and carbonate. The second compound contains only nonmetal atoms, so we know that it's a molecule. We indicate the number of each atom in the name using prefixes. This last question is a tough one. Nitrate is a polyatomic ion held together with covalent bonds, but potassium nitrate is an ionic compound held together by ionic bonds. This substance has both types of bonds in it. 